So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, today's uh, wireless uh, Rice ECE wireless distinguished lecture series. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, just a bit of uh, logistics and instructions for today's talk. Uh, please uh, leave your questions in the Q&A section uh, so that after the talk, I, I can uh, read it to the audience and our speaker uh, so uh, she could uh, respond. Uh, so um, with that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker today. It's our great pleasure uh, to have uh, Dr. Heather Zhang. Uh, Dr. Heather Zheng is the uh, Neubauer Professor of Computer Science at the University of Chicago. Uh, she received her PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, from University of Maryland College Park in 1999. Uh, she uh, joined the University of Chicago after spending 12 years at University of California at Santa Barbara where she was a professor and before that uh, spending six years in industry labs such as Bell Labs in New Jersey and Microsoft Research Asia. Uh, she is a fellow of IEEE, uh, a, a ACM Distinguished Scientist, Work Technology Network Fellow, and notably recipient of MIT Technology Review's uh, 35 under 35 uh, award. She also won many other awards, as well as uh, several best uh, paper uh, awards as well. Her work has been covered by media outlets such as Scientific American and New York Times and MIT Tech Review. Uh, she served as a program committee co-chair of Mobicom and Dicepan, and is the general co-chair for Hotnets uh, 2020. Uh, she's on the steering committee of Mobicom and is the chair of SIG Mobile Highlights Committee. Um, again, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Zheng, and uh, without further ado, Dr. Zheng, the floor is yours. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about my experience of applying machine learning uh, into mobile system design and um, very recent work on adversarial machine learning as well. Okay. Okay. So um, many of you may have seen these pictures that one of the hottest topic in research these days is machine learning. And um, it took many years, starting from 1950s and then until 2008, where deep learning started to um, move in and revolutionize the entire fields. Now, many of us have been starting to using ML to uh, solve a lot of challenging and difficult problems. Okay, so it's a very simple process. You know, you, there's models about machine learning and then you get some label data, you train the model, the model recognize some hidden features about these data and then help us identify the solution of the problems in terms of a classification or regression result. Okay, so I think this is a, a common kind of a knowledge that a lot of people are learning these days is becoming a common knowledge that we need to be equipped for the future generation. So um, despite its popularity, um, and some of you may actually see in this picture is a lot of question arise in terms of how do we actually use machine learning models, right? So this basically says that, you know, you just pure data into it, it magically give you the answer and we should trust that answer. And what answer is wrong, it's not expected. Maybe we just, you know, retrain the model, changing the data or do whatever things we can to make the answer right. So clearly there's a lot of black arts in this domain. So my, my job today is essentially trying to use my experience in using machine learning in my own research to really understand when we apply machine learning, especially deep learning, into a practical system to solve practical problems, what challenges we need to be fake, we will face, and what we need to watch out for. So essentially, I'm going to talk about two things. One thing is issue of data dependency and scarcity. So in that regard, we need to think about what kind of ML model algorithm that we need to be using for the current problem we're targeting. I think that's something we learn in, in sort of in the hard way using my own project experience. The other one is a lot of time when you train machine learning models, especially deep learning models, you train a black box there's some sort of like a model non-transparency is very different from a parametric model where you know the model design, the model structure, everything else, what it's looking for. In a lot of the DNN model, you don't really know what is going on in terms of model surface, everything else. 
So there's um, this kind of open up vulnerability to attacks that trying to trick the DNN models to make the wrong classification results. So how do we attack those and how do we defend our model you know, against these uh, powerful attacks? So my job today is essentially using my lab's own experience um, to, um, to, to share our experience in terms of using, protecting, and attacking DNA models in practical mobile systems. Not necessarily purely model, mobile, but today everything's model, so it's a mobile system anyway. Okay, so um, let me start the first one. Um, the first one is data dependency. So as this, tape, as this figure shows that when we actually train the machine learning model, we get some data, we try training, we tested the trained model using our collected data. And you can draw cross-validation, can do a lot of tricks to make sure that you utilize every single bit of the data, squeeze every single value out of the data. But a lot of time when we apply this in reality systems, there we, our model is going to see a lot of untested samples. So does the model still work? Does the solution still work? So we need to think about, you know, what's the way to validate the model in this sense? So I want to share some of the three projects that uh, helped me understand this um, problem better and also guided us in choosing the right machine learning model in each different kind of a situation. Okay. So our experience is essentially in terms of a wireless or mobile is dealing with noisy data. So many of you working wireless, you know that in a lot of time, the sensor, the radio collect data, they're full of noise, lots of different level of noise. Some easy to remove, some very hard to remove or even recognize. And they will definitely misguide us to the wrong decision. So our goal is essentially, well, if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. So what if I can do pre-processing of these things to cut up the bad data? So essentially I'm using a machine learning model or machine learning to identify bad data and try to remove them before I apply any of them to my future process. Okay, so that's our goal. So how do you identify good and bad data? So there are two ways of using machine learning models. The first one is essentially classification. You somehow magically know that this is good data, this is bad data because you know the output, you know the ground truth, and then you say, oh, I label this as good data, label this as bad data, and then somehow I build a classifier, and once you give the label, this binary classification can give you some good results. Okay, fine, yeah, you can do that. But a lot of time when I train the DNA model, I train the classifier, I even train a normal machine learning model, if I look at the feature weights, we apply kind of different feature recognition and feature weights and things, identify critical feature, they don't really give us the right feature. They give us about top 20 features. They all look very similar to each other. So for me, in reality, I don't know what is going on in the data that tell me it's good and bad. So um, we naturally went to a second uh, option is called feature clustering. It's essentially some, it's not even deep learning, it's more about unsupervised learning that identify hidden features that naturally displayed by the data itself. Um, we, before we actually use this uh, method to analyze uh, online social network, the user behavior uh, study, and it worked very, very well on a huge amount of social network data. So I thought, hey, why not apply this idea to wireless data and then try to use this to identify good and bad data. In the user study, in the user behavior, we're trying to identify real user versus symbols, which is like a fake user. So here, can I use this to identify good user versus uh, good data versus bad data? So that's exactly what I did. Okay, so how do you do that? So essentially, this is a known technique called feature clustering. So essentially you get some input and um, you identify some kind of feature vectors and you're trying to use this to apply clustering. The clusters basically identify these cluster other data that share a similar kind of feature set. Their features very similar, the combination of features very similar and some other cluster are other similar. So you can apply a traditional clustering mechanism to divide them in the feature space. This is not, not very hard to do. And magically, we got a similar result, like the social network is, they somehow allow us to create good clusters versus bad clusters. Good cluster meaning that the good data set that leads to us to very clean output results, and the bad clusters where the data leads to very poor results. So I saw this is kind of a natural exhibit. It's like the fake versus your real user, 
if you have very noisy data versus normal data, this clustering can also separate them. So this is this is very encouraging. So we had this two paper trying to publish it. The the bottom paper too, it's a Kai paper, is a user behavior study, and I applied this to the wireless signal measurement in that regard. Okay, and we validate this using uh, cellular signal uh, measurement. So essentially, at that time, we were able to get this public data set online called um, uh, cell ID. Sorry, I forgot what's exactly. It's, it's, it's a data set online we put online. It has the raw signal strengths captured in solar networks, including the signal noise, uh, sorry, the RS, the location of the measurer, and also the ground truth location of the base station. So the goal of this task is essentially utilizing the cross-sourced signal strengths to localize the base station. So we have the ground truth of everything. And especially in terms of RSS measurement, we have a 17 million data and about 35K cells. So this is a large data set. And there's some unlabeled data in terms of they don't have the exact ground truth of the base station, but there's even more data in this regard. So we apply this message to the three Germany, Poland, Russia, which has ground truth data set, and the USA has no ground truth base station data set. So they have a huge amount of measurement. So this is called OpenCell ID. Another complementary one is called OpenBMAP. So this uh, figure, uh, if you can see my, the mouse, you can see that the left uh, lower figure shows that our feature cost increased three clusters. These are the localization error generated by the data utilized in each cluster. Okay, so you can see that we're able to get two clusters, cluster A and B, which has a very good, reasonably good localization error, and another cluster with much high variance of the data. And, and you know, this gives us a sense uh, we can actually identify critical features that allow us to separate different feature, different clusters. And we found out that the critical um, features are the RSS standard deviation. And um, there's one more feature, but they actually give us pretty good idea of separating different clusters. So this is good because it tells us not only we are able to separate good and bad data, we'll also be able to identify what feature that allow us to identify them. So if I'm a data collector, I look at the RSI standard deviation, then I know that currently my data is good and bad. And then I can try to say, delete this data, bad data, collect more good data, sort of like that. Okay, so this is great because it allows us to largely basically reduce the localization accurate, uh, reduce the localization error by using only the good data, but not using the bad data. So this gave us a lot of uh, confidence in using the data collected. So then I did this for solar. I thought, hey, why not do this in Wi-Fi? So we have another um, project in the year later that we start to looking at Wi-Fi um, signal strength measurement and use this to identify IoT space inside the house. So here, if I'm an attacker outside, if I wanted to have a Wi-Fi sniffer, I collect the data, uh, I walk around the house, collect the data, and then can I infer where the uh, wireless camera is at when I localize these IoT devices, then I can better carry out the crime better. Right? So that's exactly. Again, here we run into the same problem is that the data collected by the attacker sniffer is noisy. So can I use the same methods we applied before to identify good data and remove the bad data? So that's exactly what we're trying to do in this project. Okay, so, okay, so we, we did a lot of measurement. I get my student to basically I was at UC Santa Barbara at that time. We did a lot of camera and we tried to exhaust all the location we can find to play these different cameras, different IoT devices, and did a lot of walk around, around the campus, around different office buildings, around different hall, around single houses, and we collect a lot of data. And we have about, you know, 2.1, uh, uh, sorry. 1,200 working traces with 2.4 million kind of RS position kind of data sets. So this is still reasonably large, but not as large as before. And luckily we found a similar thing. We identified uh, in terms of a localization error, kind of a three clusters, but now um, we have one good cluster and two bad cluster. So in that case, you know, the RSS standard deviation and the feeding like a 
publication model feeding in MSC, another feature, other two dominant feature allow us to identify or separate the two, uh, separate the three clusters. So this is great. So again, I, I applied this and it worked even for the Wi-Fi data. So we were very, very happy. And because it doesn't really depend on the environment because we try to collect over different indoor, outdoor, different kind of environment, and it seems to be environment agnostic. So we were very happy we published a paper about it and was very well recognized at that time. Okay, so it's the same thing from the previous model seems to work and carry on to this. And next, um, and this next, what we did is I moved to Chicago, I started a new project is I'm not satisfied of just locating IoT device inside the room, I want to locate person without a device inside the room. So essentially we were able to um, develop a new method that if I can actually locate the IoT devices to their room level, then I can run a static sniffer outside to essentially identify the motion. So the detailed paper is in the NDSS um, 2000, um, uh, 2020 that if you're interested, go take a look. But the, but the problem is I need to still first find out where the IoT location is at. So what I, that's what I use in the project two is exactly what I did. So I did that. So I get my student to collect the Chicago data set. We moved to Chicago because in the previous one, we don't have any data with user walking around inside the room. Now we need to restart collecting the ground truth data and then do repeat everything again. Again, we deploy so many different IoT devices, 11 homes, a lot of devices, volunteers, and trying to grab all the floor plans and do everything. And then I apply the same feature, same model, previously trained to here, and it failed. It doesn't, it couldn't recognize the clusters anymore. So we were very frustrated. We don't know exactly what's going on. We analyzed the data. We found the data do actually display slightly different features. It's possible because, first of all, maybe Chicago is colder. And also because we have different kind of a building here, we have more high rises and dorms. And in Santa Barbara, we have more due to earthquake protection, a different kind of a building structure. Maybe these things changes. But somehow the model we used before, the methods we used were never applied here. So it's very, very data dependent. So what we did is we had to say, okay, we cannot rely on a model. What can we do? So we switched back to a very classical kind of stats level data sifting methods is consistent data. We use Monte Carlo random sampling to identify, you know, you random sampling part of the data and you run the same kind of localization, if they give you a consistent model and you do clustering on that, and that can give you the one. So essentially I switching to a very complicated feature engineering kind of message back to a traditional stats based methods. And it worked pretty well, but it needs more data in this case. So I think a lot of time it's important to understand that the machine learning models are really, really data dependent. If you want to have a high quality models, they're usually trained with very large label data sets. If you look at in the image domain, in the other domain, in the speech domain, they have a huge amount of a label data set so that they can start to build some you know, reliable models, at least for some domain. In wireless, we, our solar data set has a huge amount of data. It gives us a more confidence in terms of these things can generalize, can generalize not only across region, but also generalize across country from, you know, from European to US. But in terms of a Wi-Fi data set we have, it doesn't even generalize from Santa Barbara to Chicago. Maybe if I collect much more data from many, many cities, from many, many Wi-Fi environment, I will eventually be able to build up that model, but currently I don't have that resources. So what happens if you're running, you're building a system or building a solution, but you don't have a large scale data set? I think it's important to choose your ML or stats model carefully based on the problem context and the data availability. So in that sense, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the transfer learning thing that in the next slides. And you need to figure out a way to justify the model's accuracy and generality. So we learned that in the hard lesson but I think this exercise is great. At least my team recognized that the data dependency part of it is in, very important in when we apply uh, machine learning to our practical systems. So uh, one thing I wanted to say a little bit more is wireless 
in order for people to work a lot in terms of using DNN model and wireless, we do need to have a large model, at least trained on some very large amount of data set. This is because, you know, in image, we, or even in audio, in a lot of space, we use the methods of transfer learning to reduce the data training kind of a complexity. What it does is, if you have company, small company or researcher like us, we have a limited training data. It's customized, it's localized, collected, right? If we use that to train model from scratch, it's unlikely the model is able to converge or we have no idea whether it will converge or not. But what if Google or somebody else or race <laughs> basically build a highly trained model, use a lot of data or different kind of environment training. So maybe using ImageNet or large, it may take one month, one week to train, it may take it one year to collect. But what it does is we can apply the concept called transfer learning to customize the teacher model in here from Google into a high quality model by tuning some of the layers in the last part of the, the model to fit more local data. So a lot of time these transfer learning doesn't need a huge amount of data set because the feature extractor is already well defined by the highly trained model. And the new model, which is customized for your local data, only need to change the last few layer in terms of generating the labeling or a small tuning to feed the data. This can largely reduce the training overhead and also possible give us more confidence in the generated model. Okay, so I think a single model like this, as a teacher model generated by Google here, can benefit many, many wireless research in that domain. So I was hoping that somebody in the wireless field is able to collect these data and then work together to build this large model that everybody can benefit. Of course, this only applies to some part of a wireless domain because we have a huge amount of tasks to do. This may not be able to, to apply to many tasks, but transfer learning can also happen across tasks but currently we don't have this type of model even to start with. So that's my message of, you know, having these models important. If we don't have it, then we need to very carefully choosing the, 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 the type of machine learning model we use. Okay. All right. So um, I hope that that message is clear. So I'm going to move to the second part of it. Okay. So the second part, um, I believe is very important for using machine learning models is the be aware of the model non-transparency. So essentially when you train a special DNN model, um, it's, it's essentially viewed as a black box to you. The data goes in, train the model, it comes out, give you the right result. But it's very difficult to interpret how the machine reached that. There's no much logic, explainable logic that human can't really understand. And this non-transparency gives a lot of, display a lot of vulnerability to attacks, okay? So there are already multiple examples of the making wrong decisions. So the models make wrong classification results. A lot of time is because they've never seen the data, but a lot of time is also because attacker inject certain triggers into the input that tricks the DNN to make the wrong decision. So I'm going to talk about that as well. And a lot of time, even the model is well trained, but if the attacker poison the training data, the attacker can actually inject a wrongful behavior into the model or a hidden behavior into the model. And these are unexpected behavior. And then only the attacker knows how to activate those. And this we call backdoors. This is even more dangerous because once they injected, a lot of these behavior are destined to happen when the attacker triggered them. So these are the two essentially big categories of attack in DNN models today. One is called input attack or adversary example. The other one is called backdoor or relative poison attack. So my lab has been working in terms of defense against these attacks. But I will also um, use some of these tech to help us uh, building uh, defenses against um, anything violent personal privacy. So I'm going to talk about these next. Okay. So the first attack is called adversary input, and sometimes we call it evasion attack. So what it does is a trick, it does nothing with the training. At the inference time, you 
inject the input to the DNA model, trick the DNA into uh, misclassifying input. So here you see Angela Jolene's face. And if you add some kind of a noise image, which is kind of a human imperceptible, and the model will basically misclassify her as Adam Self. So, I mean, you will see probably Panda, many other similar kind of examples, but that's the adversary input. In reality, adversary input usually needs white box model. That means I need to know what the model, the DNA model architecture weights everything. So it's called white box so that I can compute, given the input, the perturbation I needed to trigger this classification. So when I basically talk about these people and ask me, just protect the model, don't leak your model out, then you're fine. Once you leak the model out, of course you're vulnerable. So what if you keep the model secure? Can you still break the system and make the adversary input possible? And we show that it's possible. This is because transfer learning. Okay, so a lot of time when the small company train a model, they train the model by taking a teacher model and then use that teacher model to adapt the teacher model, change some part of the teacher model and make them the local model. And that local model is being kept secure. But a lot of time these teacher models, they don't have a lot of teacher model and these teacher models are mostly public. So knowing these teacher models, you can still attack the system. And this is what we show is that it's very simple. The idea is very simple. Instead of doing this at the output, you just mimic neurons. If this is a new, this is a uh, machine learning neural network process, at each layer you process more, you process more, eventually add the classification result. And if at this particular point, these, the blue point here, are the blocks that will be changed by the, doing the transfer learning to update the local model. And these white box are exactly the model kit from the teacher model because you don't need to change all of them. You want to keep some of the feature tractor to maintain the model uh, low complexity. So if I know the teacher model, at least this part, then I can train the perturbation to make the target image and the source image to behave very similar in the neuron domain. Uh, if I mimic the neuron here, then whatever you do afterwards doesn't really matter. You change it doesn't really matter because if they're the same here, they're going to be the same at the output. So this is essentially if you use a transfer learning because a lot of company, a lot of individuals use transfer learning to train their model. If I know the teacher model, then I can attack you. So what we did is essentially showing that this can be, in fact, it happened. You don't need to have a white box model of the student you just need to have a white box model of the teacher, and then you're done. Okay, so we try this using different kind of uh, very uh, safety critical uh, applications like a facial recognition, like uh, iris recognition. They have a very high uh, attack success rate. So this is very dangerous because that these are the critical safety applications we use today. And we also did this on real live system by using Google, Microsoft, and Facebook, because they all tell you how to do the transfer learning, you get their teacher model, and then you can basically achieve uh, larger than 88% attack success rate in all these three different services. So that's the danger of using transfer learning. Okay, so the, how do you defend against this? So this is again very simple. You just have to train the student to make internal representation deviates from the teacher you have to change some of these neuron representation layers so that once these are changed, the attacker has very difficult time, especially at the early layers, to make the neuron look very similar. The amount of perturbation they need to inject is much larger than before and can be easily interpreted by the human. Okay, so we show that before patching, before we use this, um, our defense, the attack access rate is very high. After patching, the access rate drops significantly in this into 30% or even 12%. And the classification accuracy may not decrease. It's kind of a little bit random. So the caveat of this one is you need more data because once you have to update more layers of the teacher model, you definitely need more data. But you don't trade off the quality or the data de and demand just because you want to trade off the security. When the security is um, important to you, I think these misclassification event you try to avoid, then you need to have more data to make the model more reliable. 
So I think that's something we're trying to say is, don't think that if you use a secure student model, then you're secure. You have to really make sure you're different from the teacher model in some part of the neural layer. Okay. All right, so the second part of the um, attack is something we call backdoors. In my view, backdoor is much more dangerous than the adversary input because, or it should not be a dangerous, it should be much more powerful because they are hidden malicious behavior trend into a DNA. It's not happening naturally, it's trend intentionally into a deep learning model. So consider the following. Today, we use a lot of um, cross-sourcing to label the data. Whoever submit the label can intentionally poison the data the training data set to inject the backdoor. A somehow uh, a bad employee can do this as well. So, and this is very dangerous because it's very hard to detect. The reason is that the DN, the trend model, the injected model or the backdoor model DN behave naturally on clean inputs. Here's an example. You have a stop sign recognizer for your self-driving car and you have these signs, of course it will generate the correct kind of output, okay? But if you add a trigger, this is a backdoor trigger injected into the DNN model, then any image with this trigger, with this trigger, whether it's on stop sign yield or do not enter, when it classified by the model, it will pacify that into the green light, okay? So attacker can specify behavior on any input, not just one input, any input with this particular trigger. If you don't put the trigger on, the attack will not happen. Only the attacker knows the trigger and the attacker will basically activate the attack in real time. So this is very dangerous. Think about this is that if you have a facial recognition, my student can put up this particular glasses and you know pretend to be us or pretend to be somebody else and sign the season and graduate the next day. That's our, that's our joke in the lab. But this is very dangerous because it applies to any input. And if you don't wear the special glasses, you don't have that effect. So it's very difficult to detect. So backdoor is not, we did not discover the backdoor. Backdoor was discovered by several research in MLSEC. And um, it's very diff easy to do. You just need to put these uh, poison training data set, you know, modify those, add this into a speed limit, and then you know you put those there. And then you do it. And then the trend data essentially, a trend model essentially carry the behavior defined by these poison data. And there's other work in terms of I can even optimize the type of data, a type of trigger I injected to really maximize the, the effectiveness of the attack. So you can say, hey, this is easy. Why can't I just detect this, um, these um, by looking at the training data set? Right. But the thing is, a lot of time, this requires human inspection. You have to inspect a lot of these data yourself. And how do you ensure that the human basic inspected is not really bad and do something else? Mm -hmm. But more importantly, in reality, you don't have the access to the, all the training data. To a company who gives out these models to you, they don't really want to release their training data. The training data is a big asset to the company themselves. So our defense is looking at, if I'm a user, somebody gave me a DNN model, I need to understand without access to the training data set, whether the DNN model I have is infected or not. If infected, what is the target label? Okay, what is generated to? And more importantly, what is the trigger it used? And if I can detect the trigger, is there any way for me to detect and reject adversary input so that I'm not suffering from the misclassification or the attack? And more importantly, can I patch the DNA model to remove the backdoor so I can use the model safely? So that's our goal. So that's our work last year in terms of recon neural cleanse is trying to say, give me a model. I want to trim up all the backdoors out of it. And the assumption is that I get, um, I get a DNN model clean. I have a small set of a correctly labeled sample data. That's very easy. You have to get some of those and it's not that hard to, to get. You have some computational resources, but I do not have the training data, especially the poison training data provided by the attacker. Okay, so I think that's our idea. So 
I'm not going to talk about the detail, but essentially, uh, this is some or some sort of similar to some of the signal processing or the security uh, area problem in terms of detecting wormholes. So think about the, the back doors. So imagine the old space is dividing into some kind of a feature coordinating space. What the classification does essentially is classifier divide the space into some regions in the feature space, and you're trying to mark each region with a label. Okay, so somehow these regions are widely separated and so that you can have different cluster, one for each particular label. Okay, and these are the input space ones and then you need to deviate a lot from one input to another in order to jump from one label to another label. So from this red to green or from red to purple, you still need to jump a lot in the input space. But backdoor make this a different. A backdoor is essentially creating a wormhole that if you add a tiny little bit of a perturbation or small change to the image, that you suddenly shift from one image, one class to another class. So it's essentially generate a wormhole to a target. So here is a target which is uh, purple and essentially you generate a wormhole. So essentially our goal here is to detect whether such wormhole exists and if it exists, what's the target class and how do I identify the trigger or reverse engineer the trigger to do that? So that's exactly what we did. We did something sort of like anomaly detection to detect the behavior because a wormhole create a weird behavior across these different kind of labels. Okay, so we're able to achieve pretty good um, detection accuracy of flagging input with high activation in terms of the malicious neurons. And we can use unlearning. If I reverse engineer the trigger, we're able to remove and um, by unlearning the backdoor injected into the model and come up with a clean um, model. So essentially cleanse the model itself. However, the uh, caveat of this work is one of, it's probably the first work in this domain, but it doesn't deal with a large set of um, larger triggers. It's trying to find the trigger that minimize the amount of perturbation generated to launch the attack. But if you're using bigger trigger, my sys our system may not work very well. So this trigger, a lot of follow-up work in terms of what if you have more complex triggers, not necessarily that those optimize the perturbation, but just trying to make the attack effective. So this is still an active research topic. There's a lot of follow-up work in this domain. So if you're interested, please read the backdoor paper and you can see a lot of other interesting uh, follow-up paper after that. Okay. So um, now I think I have about maybe 10 minutes. I'm going to talk a little bit more about my recent work is trying to, instead of attacking a defense, I'm trying to turn around and looking at how do I really uh, attack a, a attack the end model for good. So um, my recent work is more about protecting user privacy by attacking the end models. This is because these days, it's because the end model is so easy to build. Some companies, once they're getting your data, no matter how they get it, whether authorized or unauthorized, it's so easy to build ML model to recognize you. Okay, so you, everybody should, some of you may actually clear of these New York Times articles, a few, a few months ago about the Clearview. So essentially, the Clearview essentially is a company that scrapping photos online from your social data set and then essentially building a facial recognition model that will be able to recognize you without even your consent. Okay, so they're just getting your online social network um, data. And this is being widely used by many people. They can just purchase that and then generate them uh, and, and just use the model. As an individual user, how do I protect myself against those, uh, against many things, including this facial recognition, including even somebody recording my, I use a microphone recording my voice. So how do I do that? So our works recently is something called Fox. So we wanted to say, we want to give individual users some agency in protecting themselves against these third party unauthorized facial recognition models. So essentially, if you can solve the problem at the source, so there's there's different solution. There's like, how about you wearing a mask or you wear heavy makeup or you wear some kind of a trigger, some things that prevent you uh, at the wrong time, the any camera to recognize you. We propose a different solution. Why not addressing this from the source? 
is that what if we prevent these companies to use your online images to train the correct model? What if I can control my online image, which I uploaded or other people uploaded? What if I can control these? What if I add something, a perturbation, a trigger into these images before I upload? And then that prevents anything built on these online photos to produce a face recognition of me when I'm not wearing any of these artificial things. When I'm just at the street, a street camera take of somebody else recognize me without me wearing any kind of makeup or any triggers, then that's our idea. So essentially is you're a user, you have some kind of limited computation resources, you can get a well-trained feature tractor, which our package has. And then before you upload your photo to social networks, you add some perturbation into your photo. Okay. And these other third party unauthorized without your consent who are trying to use your photo, they scrap your protected or cloaked images and they essentially build your facial recognition model. Well, they can recognize you with that perturbation on you but they cannot recognize you without these perturbation on you. So that's exactly, we use this kind of poison based of attack, but allow individual user to attack back in terms of these unauthorized DNA models against us. So we tried this um, using um, real facial recognition APIs from Microsoft Asia, Azure and Amazon and Facebook Plus, which is data part. And we found out that they actually give us pretty good accuracy of protection no clean image identify user or misclassified. Okay. I'm not gonna talk about detailed explanation about the book, but you know, here, I, I don't know whether people can take a look which one is the cloaked photo, which one is not. So this is also on our website that you can see that the cloak doesn't really do much of a perturb I mean, inseparable result to your photo. So you don't feel much has changed, but now if you upload your photo to the internet, you're protecting yourself from the third party companies. The more photos you upload, all the photos you upload, it will protect you more. And now you should upload all your kids' photos because as they grow up, they can be even more protected because all their photos will be caught, or their online photos will be caught. So uh, we have this website and um, we have a paper which is presented last week. And um, we also have also different kind of software for you to upload. So try the cloak, try the fox to protect your online photos before you post to any social website. We have a lot of download. I hope that uh, rice user could be one of them as well. Okay. All right. So along the same line, I also did another project in terms of protecting user privacy against microphones. Uh, in microphones, it's harder um, to deal with the speech recognition. We're really not attacking the speech model, but injecting this kind of a noise uh, in ultras uh, ultrasonic noise trying to disrupt the, the microphone itself. So this is more about the design um, problem. But what it does is again, attacking the uh, uh, speech recognition system, instead of generating the noise all the time, we only generate noise kind of like a, I should not say pseudo randomly or some kind of periodically so that it's very difficult to remove, doesn't cause a lot of energy, but it breaks down the voice recognition system. So um, we also have a website that talk about the design aspect. So feel free to visit the website and check out our paper as well. Okay. All right. So um, I, uh, my job today is trying to share my lab's experience in using, protecting, and attacking machine learning and DNA models. I hope that our experience in this domain can call for proper use of ML and DL, um, deep learning models in practical system, uh, particular along the line of data dependency and also non-transparency, which leads to vulnerability of attacks and, and defenses. And uh, you know, as we're trying to use these trade training models, we really do need to use them responsibly. And I think that it's a time for us to realize that and trying to do more interesting work along this line and to build more powerful and robust models. Okay, so in the end, I'd like to thank my uh, lab members. We just changed our name because we're now very focused on security. So we changed it to 
uh, security algorithm networks and data at Stan Lab. We have a lot of great students, I'm very proud of them. And this is my collaborator, Ben Zhao, which we uh, collaborate a lot on the Adversary ML and many other projects. And, um, you know, um, that I'll keep it there. And um, thanks to everybody for your time. Um, for image and for audio, we have a lot of like existing devices, off the shelf devices that allow us to collect them. A lot of these data already exist online. You just need to search them through social networks, search them through the Google search, you already got these data. So I think a lot of these real time and then hardware based kind of a data collection is very difficult for wireless. And also a lot of these um, vision or speech data, they come from the similar data set or the shared data set. Right. So, but in wireless, we do a lot of different type of kind of uh, tasks and each data task require different kind of uh, granularity, different kind of aspects of the data. So I think different layers of the data. So I think it's much harder to basically build a shareable data set that a lot of people can use and contribute to. So I think that kind of a segmented kind of uh, uh, space make it harder to collect wireless data. And also wireless data also consume a lot of um, space. My structural data, I had to processing a lot to cut the, um, the granularity in order to make it shareable. But you know, it's still small data set. So I'd love to see more um, efforts in that domain. Maybe the citywide test bed, all these kind of different efforts can give us a lot of diverse data set and more like a multi-layer data set allow us to look at even the cross layer design. Uh, I think that's a that's a hard problem, but it's a it's hopefully it's being resolved right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Ashu looks like has a question. Ashu, um, go ahead. I will ask one, and there's I think some more lined up. Uh, has a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> in in the last part where you are uh, you know enabling privacy by essentially users. Um, I guess polluting or corrupting their own images by making the software itself available, isn't it now possible to just take that and reverse engineer? So it's just a matter for me to take the clear view to download the software, know exactly how it works, and then augment their training algorithms. Yeah, great question, Ashu. So the software itself is given to individual user, but in, in here, the software itself is actually online runtime random. So basically when it cloaks you, it choose some kind of a targets to move your in the feature space into another person's space. But that person is randomly selected. So it's very difficult for the attacker to reverse engineer in terms of where you're gonna go to. But I guess- they, Mm -hmm. I guess maybe there is a statistical reverse engineering which is possible if I if I gave all the my training data set and pass it through your software I would now have a statistical understanding of what it is doing yeah but in that case then their training data set has to be very small or is limited I but see. the visual recognition is more about the popularity I have mm -hmm. recognized many people so and and I think now is is also very difficult to essentially say what is cloak or not not cloak so mm. it's kind of a mixture in that. But more importantly, it's harder to reverse engineer. We're not saying this is completely safe, maybe in a few years or maybe in a few months, that somebody can break <laughs> this. But at least now, I think this is one of the first one that gives user the, the power, at least I can go against these kind of a powerful company rather than do nothing about it. So does it have a computational guarantees of sort? Like which, which typically we associate with security, right? RSA and others are, have certain type of a computational guarantees. Is there something we can associate with this work yet? Oh, it's very difficult to say a guarantee. Um, I, I try to do some status analysis of this, but it's very dependent on the data set. So now we're trying to make the cloaked photo in terms of the feature space far away from the user. You cannot be too far away because if you're too far away, you're at the boundary, become anomaly, then I can detect anomaly against you. But you want it to be in the middle. Luckily, if these for these third party official are going to be useful, they have to detect lots of people. So your feature space has to be very big. So that complexity is high enough, allow us to hide inside. Mm -hmm. Although we cannot provide such a guarantee, it's already complex enough and powerful enough to prevent, sort of prevent future uh, reverse mm -hmm. engineering. Okay, great. Thank you. There are lots of questions lined up, so I will start. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
Yes, so we have actually a uh, next question from, is ya from Yasemin. Um, so she asked in the last part, I was wondering what information on the face recognition DNA models needs to be known to user to preserve the privacy of uploaded pictures. Oh, so we have a shared uh, feature extractor. Oh, let me go back to this one. So each user will have a feature extract, will be given a feature extractor that's inside the software. The feature extractor will automatically extract the feature and decide how do I generate the perturbation to minimize uh, the, the, the perception of changes while make your, your feature away from your actual clean images feature. So user doesn't need to need much, the, the software itself already contain that. And because the feature extractor is more about identify key phase component, regardless what the tracker use, they share this kind of a similar feature, this model, something called model transferability naturally carries our attack against many different the feature extractor. So these three models like uh, Azure, Amazon, and Face++, they all use very different feature extractor. We do not know what they use, but our models still apply, the, the attacks still apply. Okay. All right, so the next question is from Edward. Uh, he's asking, have you considered using physical models to aid machine learning? For example, wireless channel models? Yes, um, great question. So, so I, I can share some of, um, some of my colleagues that actually start to build uh, models that integrate a physical model with machine learning. That's an active research area. For me, I think, um, for me, using physical model is more about adding domain knowledge into your training. Um, so far, um, I, my success in that domain is, 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 is zero. <laughs> I try to uh, use GAN, initialize the GAN to use the physical model to reproduce, to model the wireless propagation I film is really when I start to roll in the real time data. I think it's also possible because some of the physical model we have is still too simple and the, 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 how do I say, the, the accuracy level of that model versus the real, time, real life data is still too high so that, you know, currently I haven't been able to bridge the, between the two. But then maybe I was looking at the wrong model, maybe the, the, part, the, the problem I'm tackling is, is just not too difficult for that or, or I haven't used it in the right way. But I think that's a good direction because the domain knowledge at least used by, has been proved by image or speech domain to greatly greatly enhance these um, machine learning models. So I think this should happen in a wireless channel, but you know, I don't know how accurate the channel model needs to be in order for that to happen. My, my experience has been low, but it might be a different, pro a different context, a different problem will show different results. Um, okay, unless Edward has a follow-up question. Um, Okay, uh, so the next question is from Wei Tao Wang. Uh, so the question is, would that raise a competition with, between the person who want to protect uh, pi privacy and the companies who want to collect information, that people protect their pictures in some way and company detect this method and ignore them in the future? So, yeah, so you're, you're referring that, you know, what, if, if, I, if a company said denoises, can I that remove the fox noise, right? We try that. It's, you have to really, if you denoise, you have to denoise to a certain amount that breaks the facial recognition model in order to remove the, uh, the fox uh, uh, effect. The reason is the, the, you can see that from these images, you know, the natural image, in the human perception, it's very difficult to find where the perturbation is at. I don't know whether you can tell which one, which one is the cloak, which one's not cloaked. So the denoise, we're not, you can see there's no noise. They do not know where did you add this to because our algorithm doesn't tell you where do you add these. And every time where you add those is also random, right? So in this case, um, it, we tried uh, in the paper, we tried different way. We tried different denoise, we tried resizing, we tried, uh, uh, compression, we try many things. You have to go to the level that breaks down the entire uh, picture so that your facial recognition fails until this method is working. Okay. I think that's the powerfulness of poison attack. 
is that you train the model to recognize that and the model essentially so, so the poison essentially allow you to deviate uh, the feature space and the feature space jump and the input space jump is nonlinear. So this nonlinearity helps a lot of hiding the big feature space change with very subtle input space change. That's where the DN model failed <laughs> in many cases, but in this case, it helped us in privacy. Yeah. Was, are there any scenarios for intelligently extending fakes to video? Not easy. If you want to do a live video, then it's hard because it still requires time. Now we're doing time, we're doing offline, but doesn't mean that we cannot do it. I think it needs more intelligent processing. We just haven't had time to get to it right now, but it's, it's a good ongoing work or a future work. Uh, we encourage everybody to try it and, and find the right solution, more efficient solution in that regard. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. So there's actually apparently another question. If the ML model offer a list of top candidates, uh, how likely is the user appears in the list? Uh, no, it's never near that. Um, it's never on the list itself. It will probably recognize somebody as a famous actress or actor, depends on or, or somebody else, depending on who's our target model but tar targets used to cloak you, but it will not recognize uh, you. Feel free to try it. <laughs> yeah. Just go to our website. We have the GitHub, we have the source file, we have the DMG, we have a binary, everything. We encourage everybody to try it, cloak your photo. My uh, photo I sent to Rice uh, for this talk is actually cloaked. My video is not here right now. <laughs> but my, my photos in your announcement is already closed. So I wasn't, I'm not worried about my <laughs> photos anymore. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sadar. Uh, so it looks like that's all the questions. Um, okay. So thanks. Uh, thanks again, Heather, uh, for joining us today. Uh, uh, we all enjoyed your talk and also I hope you had a good visit. Uh, I also th thank you to everyone else for joining us today uh, to our uh, sixth uh, lecture for the for the series, and uh, I hope that to to see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.